The question before us is, is the black church dead? Um, and this question was of much debate this past spring when one of our panelists, um, Princeton religion professor Eddie Glaude, wrote an editorial in the Huffington Post proclaiming the death of the black church. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Right. I think that we need to wrap our right. minds around some just fundamental shifts that are taking place in the nature of, of, of African American church landscapes. Um, we're seeing in interesting sorts of ways, and I know Fred, you, you talked, you talked about this, is we're seeing the disappearance in interesting sorts of ways of the neighborhood church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, churches and their organic relationship to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. folks who live around them. In fact, if a church actually hasn't moved out into a suburban area, and stays in, yeah. most of the people who attend the church actually come from someplace else yes. to go to the church. Ardrew Smith has done some wonderful work in regards to uh, those pastors who are progressive, who stay in their neighborhoods, and the relationship actually to the community that's out there, the skepticism of folk in the neighborhood vis-a-vis -vis the church, where the church resides. So this is really complicated in a number of different ways, how the very ways in which church life have been constituted under these very unique conditions, how the demographics are placing certain pressures on the very ways in which churches function, right? And then I want to be very clear too, right? We can talk about, uh, uh, we can talk about general trends, even as we want to lift up what particular churches are doing. Um, uh, we need to be able to talk, offer general descriptions of a problematic. If we want to say that black men are disproportionately being incarcerated and someone says, but my brother isn't, that doesn't impact the fact itself, right? So part of what we want to say is that there are churches uh, that are doing extraordinary work, that are churches that are interclass, but what we're seeing are all sorts of pressures um, that are, are impacting the very demographics of churches and who sits in those pews and where they're located. And I just want to take off on what A said just a second and say, and, and twist this another way and ask the class question a different way. Who is moving from one class to another because of this economic situation? Now, I've been tracking, I've been watching Memphis, Tennessee. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there are over 24 closed black churches in Memphis yeah. right now that have had to close their doors. Now, what does that mean? That has already changed the demographic of that city. If you've got people who have lost their jobs and if they've been in these church, they've been in these churches and the church has lost their home and they've lost their home, then they went from maybe lower middle class or middle class to poverty. Okay? So this is another thing that's really happening. So we can ask that class question, but we've got to ask it a different way about how people are moving. And what this is mm -hmm. doing is it's gonna be, you know, I, I gotta quote this this um, figure that that um Professor Harris gave me, and I was just stunned, but this is so sad. The average net worth of a white woman in this country is like something like $42,000, $43,000, something like that. How, how much? Single white. Single, single white woman, yes. Single white woman. This is a woman who is not married, doesn't have anything. $42,000, $43,000. Do you know what the net worth of a black woman is in this country? Negative. $5. $5. That was stunning. Stunning. Who is sitting in the churches? Black women. So once we begin to start to think about this in some different ways and start to not just talk about this in a religious way, but to look at the economics and everything else, this is serious. Yeah, I just, this class question is a very important question and, and just um, as sort of an addendum. Um, that is one of the things that prophetic discourse brings to the fore. Um, we look, <clears throat> questioning the uh, s systemic configurations, um, the way society is set up, institutional configurations, um, asking questions about why are some people poor, some people rich, Ask, questioning capitalism, you know, and, 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 uh, and that, of course, presupposes taking some extra energy uh, in our churches to do more reading, more study. But something that, that impressed me, one of the times I spoke at J. Alfred Smith's church out in Oakland, and I noticed when it came time for the uh, announcements, and I was waiting here, someone said, give an honor to God, uh, and the, we having the bake sale, and nothing's wrong with that because I love the bake sales, but instead they got up and started reading, uh, started uh, telling people about what was going on politically, what was going on in the community, the things they should be aware of, the issues they might contemplate, um, 
and they were upholding that prophetic responsibility to raise people's consciousness to look at questions of, uh, of class. So many black people, we know that it's, that it, what, what happened with this subprime mortgage thing is terrible, but so many of our people don't have a real sense of why, of what happened and why it happened. Why aren't we questioning? Why don't we know that, that anyone who fights for radical de deregulation, they're fighting against regulatory protections for the average person, and this is not consistent with the biblical witness. I don't care what the conservatives say. Um, but these kinds of things don't come up because, uh, because prophetic, that's not a part, because prophetic discourse is not normative, and because it's not normative, we don't understand that these questions of class are questions that we can and should be, be asking. That's why I keep, keep, keep pressing it, that's why I keep saying that's the largest lacuna, I think, in our, our, our community, that and this notion of holistic spirituality that, that moves us to a certain point that says uh, of, 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 of spirituality and spiritual attainment that move that to the point that we, we can't help but love our neighbor as ourself, ourselves and want to change um, circumstance for our neighbors as we'd like them change for our own loved ones. If we shift our attention from the question of class to something that's put, already been put on the table, but if we address it more substantively about applying this love ethic that we're all appealing to, how does this get mobilized? And, and there's an interest in the audience in talking about what Obrey suggested and what Otis encouraged him to make plain, the more recent Eddie Long scandal. But rather than directing our, I said it, right? But rather than having our conversation be overdetermined by an individual, recognizing that this implicates a broader gender and sexual politic that is not just about black churches, but about religion, gender, and sexuality more broadly. How do we think about uh, strategies uh, for mobilizing this love ethic? Or what can we expect reasonably of black churches in terms of engaging its, their own sexual and gender politics? You know I got my mouth fixed up because I got a lot to say. No offense to the pastors on board with me, but you know, the first thing you have to do is when your pastor messed up, you gotta love them enough to sit them down. It's always been very interesting to me as somebody who does American religion to look at white evangelicals, and the moment that a white evangelical messes up, they throw them out the door. Or they gotta go sit down somewhere and go to, uh, go to a camp or go to reconditioning or something. <laughs> you know, or you go on to Betty Ford or you go into the sex clinic or something else. In a black church, if a pastor messes up and it's just heterosexual, Hallelujah. We gonna keep, you know, it might be a, a bad Sunday where somebody's sweating up there for a couple of hours or something and somebody gets called out, but that person can stay in the pulpit. There is no retribution for bad behavior. It's gotta stop. You know, I'm, I'm not from, the, from a black church, I'm the Catholic church. I'm on them every day about the mess that they've perpetrated. But you see, we've got the same thing right now, black churches all across the country, so I'm gonna start laying it out for you. Let me, if you go on the web right now, you can look at a website for the Church of God in Christ where all the sex um, scandals have been and how much they are having to pay up to all these people who are suing. It's a big suit today in Dallas that just came up. There's a lot of stuff going on, people. See, it ain't one church, it's a lot of them. And a lot of these churches are having, having these issues. What do we do? Well, one thing is, is to start talking about sexuality in a different way. You can't just use sexuality to get people in the door because you're selling sex. No more sheets. The lady, the lover, and her lord. <laughs> All this stuff. We, we use, I mean, people use sex to sell their sermons. And then they won't tell you when you come in the door, you can't do nothing. What about that? I mean, this is, this is double messages going on all the time. It's ridiculous. So instead of messing around, everybody's like, it's the truth. I mean, you know, it's, it's a pastor in Memphis that had a bed up there at the church. Talk about this is how you're supposed to please your spouse. Yeah, that's that's right, ridiculous, that's right. people. I didn't come to church for porn. You get that at home. Oh, in <laughs> church. See, I'm just saying it. But this is the problem. It's, 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 it's like the, the Destiny's Child song. It's no, 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 no from the pulpit when everybody really saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's got to stop. This, this messing around with this, it's not serious. But this is a serious issue. The, the, the homophobia, 
The stuff that comes out of people, some people's pulpits about gay folks and people sitting up there right in the congregation. Why would you sit there and let somebody take you on like that? Walk out the door. Don't give that person your money. Don't give that church your money. Yeah. These are the things, this is, you know, I'm, I'm being very glib about this, but I'm not really glib. I'm really grieved because mm -hmm. it is something that is tearing our churches apart. Mm -hmm. And if you look in, in places like Georgia and other places where, the, you know, who has HIV the most? African-American women. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is taking a toll, and we cannot afford to be light about this anymore. Mm -hmm. We just can't. It's time to clean house. And if, you know, if the people won't do it, somebody else will. If I could, just to, to, okay. to tweak this in terms of thinking of strategies, right? And Thea has just invited, as many churches are doing the work of offering a more inclusive sexual ethic. I give the example of a, someone that I've worked with who took uh, a church that he and his wife co pastored his, he and his wife are co-pastors, through the process of becoming open and affirming. And in the process, he coined a term called straight flight, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the same consequences of what Otis, you suggested if we take a prophetic stance on the wall. Right? So how does, in the face of that reality, how do we negotiate strategies for putting that forward? Oh, I know how to do that. Well, and I, I, oh, there's no good ahead on um, yeah, Well, within uh, the context of, of Trinity, uh, with, with a church that has a, a same gender loving community uh, in that church, and as a result, there was, there was straight flight. Now, my predecessor um, spent years teaching uh, this idea of of love and raised a fundamental question. He preached on it. Um, and the fundamental question that, that he raised and then raised within uh, biblical context, because one of the things that uh, is a little bit different about Trinity is that uh, we actually have um, professors from seminary that teach our Bible study classes so that um, you can even get credit to graduate from Virginia Union uh, if you want through some of the classes that we offer. Um, uh, at Trinity in connection with uh, several of the partnerships that we do. And so the fundamental question that he put forth, which I, I thought was incredibly powerful, was if you take the position of, you know, going to hell, sin, and all that kind of stuff, would God intentionally make someone, design someone just to go to hell? Mm -hmm. Would God Intention, and that was the fundamental theological question to jump off from there. So now let's discuss it from there. The second thing is, is that um, the, there is a rise in homophobia that was not as prevalent uh, previous to the rise of the fundamentalist movement, specifically with the Southern Baptist Church. There was, because ethical reason is determined by relationship. And so within the South, uh, there, was a, there was a position previous to the you know, 60s and 70s where if you were to make a statement in small communities um, from the pulpit, you could get sat down as pastor. Reason being is because everyone had, a, and this, this exactly happened with my first pastorate, where a gentleman who was transgender um, died, he happened to be the local florist um, in the community, and there was a deacon, it was just like, we can't have this funeral, he's this, that, and the other. And to see all of these elder, quote, homo, uh, 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 straight men stand up and say, you don't understand, when my mother died, he was there. And I will show my respect and you will not disrespect him. Second thing was, he's been in this church longer than you. And that was one of the most powerful moments to see a Southern community to say that we don't have all the theological language, but we do understand that we're in relationship with each other. And, and that becomes a jumping off point of building the fundamental relationship with people. We love doctrine. We don't like love. Can I ask you a question, Reverend Moss? I'm, I'm just interested because it, it's interesting to talk about relationship, but I also think that black people have a relationship to the Bible mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and we can say doctrine, but let's say what it really is, is really Bible, you know, and, and how you read it. It's not it. the same thing. But a particular yeah, it's, reading. But it, it's a particular oh, reading. Right. It's, a it's, particular, particular. it's a particular reading. So I, I'm just curious, because uh, I'm not going to tell on this person, but somebody said, you know, while you all are talking about all this Eddie Long thing, just don't get into the Bible stuff, because if you get into the Bible stuff, 
then you're going to have all these churches getting on you because, you know, it's, it, as long as the Bible is not contested no. about what to say about homosexuality, then this is the case. And so I'm, I'm really is. wondering about how to deal with that dichotomy because for those of us in the academy who, you know, have some ways to want to talk about this, it's one thing. But when you're in a church, it's, a, it's another thing. Well, we teach a hermeneutic of suspicion. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we do that. And, I mean, if Howard Thurman's mother can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Howard Thurman's mother said, you know what? I like Jesus. I got an issue with Paul. Yeah, absolutely. And anything he says, I ignore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean she, she had a hermeneutic of a suspicion. She said, Jesus is my model. Yeah. I can deal with that. But as soon as Paul yeah. says, be silent, I'm not being silent for nobody. But I, but, I, but I do wonder, though, that's her, but there's so many other people who won't argue with that. How do you deal with that from the pulpit? Because that's, that's my question, my fundamental question is because, you know, I can walk off and go back, you know, to Penn any day. But what the, the real issue is going to be is how does this happen if we are going to change these conversations in, in our churches? You've, you've got a good way to do this because you've got training. But for most churches, they don't have that. How does that conversation happen? Well, and I use that Southern narrative again, is that churches, which was fascinating to me, in these when I, for my first pastor uh, in Augusta, Georgia, and then having to go to these small southern communities, I couldn't understand why Atlanta could be so homophobic, but yet Blackville, South Carolina was not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it, was, it was a very interesting dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Now, they were not is, there's a continuum. There's a, they're not way over here, not way over there, just somewhere in the middle. But there was a different ethic, and I think that ethical reasoning based on relationship, because it became very difficult for certain individuals to, uh, to make certain statements. It's easy in the urban context, in a broad context, gotta keep, you know, I can do that. But when you have to look someone in the eye every day, because there's only 1,100 people in the town anyway, <laughs> you know, and 10% of them, um, more than likely, maybe same gender loving. And so, you know, you, you're raising these particular questions. And, and, I, and I heard that from many older ministers, um, usually women, um, who raised raise that question, you know, that really pastoring is not a fatherly model, but it's a motherly model. And also, in, in just a more concrete way, um, Dr. Butler, that's one reason why I do actually find it important to, while we speak uh, in generalizations and look at broad statistics, um, to also highlight um, the exceptions. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. when you, uh, the exceptions to the rule, because when, when, you, when you ask a question like that, how do these smaller churches who may not have access to uh, seminary learning or a more progressive model of ministry, how will they, uh, how will they communicate mm -hmm. liberation? How will they communicate uh, a, a God's expansive love, God as in inclusive, exclusive inclusivity rather, to their uh, congregation and through relationship with other churches who may be the exception? There is a cross-fertilization where through the preached word and through teaching, that learning can happen in spaces that are not normative spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, I think that here in Harlem, there are uh, smaller <coughs> conventions of churches, as, as in other places as well. So your storefront church will get together with a larger congregation for a week at a time where there is study, where there is preaching, where there is a, a dialogue and communication. And it's in those contexts, I think, uh, and, and hopefully there are others, but at least on the micro level, where that exchange to relationship can begin to happen. Yeah. Did, did any? I did. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, um, it's very important. I think really quickly about just a couple quick, quick points. One is, regard to why ministers are allowed to get away with so much often is that because we can confuse the what is a, a role with with a status mm -hmm. and the ministry becomes uh, a status mm -hmm. and we also uh, make personality cults Thank you. 
around, uh, around ministers. And so they, because they have a different status, they are judged a different way. And they have their catchphrases that, um, that support that, you know, something, they'll quote something from the psalm that has nothing to do with, with the context, but it'll be, touch not the head of my anointed. And, uh, and the, the other thing is that when we talk, because there is a dearth of a real tradition of interiority, you can become a pastor with no spiritual attainment at all. And I, and I know a few of them um, that they just, it's, it's mercantile and it is a good job mm. that mm. allows them to be, uh, it, it allows them to be James Brown uh, at least once a week. And, um, and of course, I mean, that's, 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 I mean, there, there are many who are, who are, who are wonderful. I mean, and I'm not generalizing, but we all know that's, that's, that's they the case. Loud, they say it loud too, and they can dance and jump and sweat just like Jane. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of teaching, if we focus on, we have to have something that's normative, and it, it must be the gospel, in my opinion. I mean, the gospel writings. Um, and if we look at the gospel writings, a lot of our, our excursions into doc, doctrinal minutia and, uh, and cul-de-sacs and irrelevancies uh, would not happen. Now, and with regard to homosexuality, I think one way that's easy to teach, that if we take the we look at the teachings of Jesus. Jesus gave one primary way to judge people in Matthew 25. He says, as you have not done it to the least of these, you have not done it unto me. As you have fed, as you have clothed, as you looked out for those who are really in need, um, then you've done it to me. But at, to the extent that you have not, you haven't done it to me. And then it ends by saying, and then off you go to hell. This is only really the, the primary judgment that Jesus gives. Now, if we use that mode of judgment, I did a C-SPAN special for the Center for American Progress, um, half hour, hour and a half on my book, The Politics of Jesus. It was lovely for me. I hope other people enjoyed it, but I certainly did. And um, in it, someone asked this question, uh, the same question. And I said, well, wait, wait a minute, wait. If we take Jesus seriously, how can I possibly... I had a colleague at Drew University when I was in the faculty there, wonderful man in, in every kind of way, uh, godly man in every kind of way, and I didn't know he was gay for the first year and a half when the faculty didn't matter. But how could I take someone like Dick Cheney, because he's heterosexual, how can I value him over someone who is loving, who does justice, who fulfills Matthew 25, but he just happens to love another one of God's creatures who are his same gender. How can I possibly do that? So, if we, again, go to the prophetic witness of the Gospels themselves as something normative and stop all these flights of fancy and all this foolishness, because if we did that, we wouldn't have the prosperity gospel. We wouldn't have all this madness. We wouldn't have Leroy Thompson talking about money. Come here, money, from the pulpit. Thank you. That must be normative to us. That's why I continue to stress it. Not, and that's, all, not, that's not just because I'm a biblical scholar, but I think it's because um, it shows that Jesus' teachings were relational and not doctrinal. He didn't teach much of anything about what to believe, but everything about how, how, to, how to live and how to treat others. Now, I want to go back to uh, and, 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 point. Just really quickly, just, just really quickly, I just think it's... Um, I, I was having a conversation with the great Jim Forbes uh, recently, and he said that we ought to uh, uh, perhaps uh, include as a part of licensing, right, that pastors commit themselves to ongoing counseling. Right, right. That's the first, I, I, I think it's a brilliant Absolutely. idea, because they're human beings. They're, they're just like we all are, cracked and, and messed up, trying to figure out how to walk this this journey with some sense of decency in the short time that we have. Second point, really quickly, is that we got to figure out how to have conversations within church spaces about sexuality and sexual yeah. desire without it being framed by negative acts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fact yeah. that the accusations around Bishop Long frame predatory acts are framing our discussion around sexuality yes, yes, mm -hmm. truncates how we think mm -hmm. about sexuality. Yes, mm -hmm. 
And so I, I think it's important for us to disentangle uh, uh, the, you know, the TMZ story, hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is Bishop Long, and the horrors that are associated with those young brothers who have had to deal with uh, what they've had to deal with. Uh, from this broader question of, of how we imagine ourselves as God's children, who desire other God's children, other children of God. Yes, yes. Um, and we got to do that in a way that is not framed um, uh, negatively, but positively. Yes. And then maybe we can get something. And some people are doing that. Yeah, I want to listen. Just a little them. small. I'm sure. just curious, if, um, and I heard this from uh, uh, it was a white Pentecostal minister not too long ago, because when you mentioned about the issue of, of sexuality, you know, why don't we sit people down? He made a statement that just kind of blew me away. Uh, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name. But uh, it doesn't make a difference who it was. But he said that black churches, you can get away with any type of sexual, quote unquote, indiscretion, um, but don't mess with the money. In white churches, you can, you can mess with the money and stay. And, um, but any particular sexual indiscretion, you're gone. Um, and he says that there is a different way that these communities view issues of sexuality. And also for a community that has not had enough, because you know, if you really want to get removed from a black church quickly, you know, just mess with someone's money, yeah. um, and there will be a physical fight very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it, but I mean that. But there's, I think there is some history behind yeah. that that we need to. Somebody needs to do some research mm -hmm. yeah. around. I would be curious around those particular. Why is it that we are so permissive? when someone um, is utilizing uh, the congregation uh, as their own personal dating service. Mm. Oh, hello. Um, a brothel. Or a brothel, maybe be one of the other. I don't even think it's dating. Yeah, but I was being nice. Um, <laughs> Want to offer up a couple of questions, try to fuse them together from uh, the audience. One is the question of um, what are the responsibility of black churches uh, to not be defined solely by serving a racial group in this moment, right? So what, right, so this is a question, but also to tie that to the question of uh, the reality of religious diversity, right? So whether it's the long stories told about the nation of Islam, but the increase uh, with the rise of increase of uh, West African Muslims, even here in Harlem, how do we think about the broader religious landscape of uh, black America and the role of black churches in engaging in conversation. So where does interfaith and interracial uh, conversation show up in what we're talking about as the present and future reality of black churches? Well, I'm, I'm minded to think about, um, and I don't know if it was this past Sunday or it's this coming Sunday. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but uh, there's gonna be a group of, um, African churches that are going to Washington to pray for America, which I thought was fascinating, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think this is fascinating is because within the midst of us, we have all these immigrant churches from the diaspora. Right. And right. so when we sit here and we talk about black church, it leaves out mm -hmm. this whole space mm -hmm. of people that are around us, especially in the urban space and where I live in Philadelphia. So I've got not only you know immigrant churches, I also have a huge Muslim community mm -hmm. there. And I, you know, I'm not sure yet because I'm still new to Philly what, what is happening there on the ground for people to speak back and forth to each other. But I do think that is a creative way to start to think about how to talk about the first thing I brought up, which is community. What does community is what is community comprised of? Are we only talking about Christian communities? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about something broader? Mm -hmm. I think we have to start, especially if we're going to do what. If I, you know, think about um, Malcolm X, especially if we're going to do anything about thinking about the diaspora and what mm -hmm. is happening in the diaspora and some of the same issues that people are facing otherwise. Otherwise, we're going to have to reach across lines in a religiously in order to make a broader kind of community so that we can have some movement back and forth. Mm -hmm. I think we need to stop talking so much about being Christians and start um, focusing more on our common humanity. Stop focusing so much on doctrinal division and start focusing on the, we focus again on the example of Jesus in the Gospels. He stressed how we should live and treat one another. 
And if we focus on that, I think uh, that will open all kinds of uh, room for, uh, for, for ecumenical uh, activities in, in the real sense. And the reason I say that because too many Christians take too much pride in being Christians. And when we take too much pride in being one thing, that's tantamount to placing a value judgment on being something else. Um, not only that, we need to sit down, and so I think we need to interrogate what it really means to be a Christian and really inter interrogate that. And I think if we, if we do that, that'll open up room uh, to talk to, to, uh, to other people. We also need to ask others, find out why others believe what they believe and not just discount them as the other and leave them as the other, but look at, at, uh, at the commonality. But then again, that comes to looking at the prophetic witness of Jesus in the Gospels, being serious about reading them, and we'll see that it's all, it's mostly about ethical behavior, how we live in the world. The kingdom of God is relational. We take that seriously about building a new heaven and a new earth. That means embracing all of humanity, not just uh, other folk who call themselves what we call ourselves. And that also means that we take a different notion, a different, um, get a different sense of what it means to be saved. Because in the Old Testament sense, it means to be de delivered, but it means to be delivered from certain kinds of conditions. And when we, uh, when we say that we are saved and others are not, then we construct this box around ourselves and we look down, can end up looking down on people in our same churches, but they ain't saved. And uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to leave that alone because you, you can imagine how many times people ask me if I'm saved. And my response is, none of your business. Why would you even ask? I think often for congregations, what's at the what uh, prohibits inter uh, or ecumenical dialogue and interracial uh, dialogue uh -huh. um, is fear, because you know again when we when we think about the Christian narrative, you know Christian triumphalism, which I think Dr. Hendricks was pointing toward. Um, is synonymous, synonymous with American triumphalism. And so what we see of the other in the media, in those spaces that are most ex or hyper accessible to our congregations, um, is predominantly negative of that which is other than mm -hmm. what we are as American. Mm -hmm. And so the Muslim um, or Islam becomes a site of fear. Um, you know, and the other, African traditional religions, becomes a site of fear for our congregations. And so I think that in order to really uh, begin to encourage um, this kind of dialogue and community amongst differences, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it has to be preached from the pulpit. It has to I mean, the people in large part, the only continuing education most of our congregations get is on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to be able to put it in, in a way that is palatable for the audiences that we, for the people that we serve. Um, but going back uh, quickly to this point about uh, norm, uh, male normativity, mm -hmm. I think that until we really are serious about uh, uh, looking at that and inquiring about how that uh, uh, affects our communities, then all of our prophetic tendencies to move forward are going to be compromised because we ought because we start from a place automatically where we believe that humanity has to be synonymous or equate with a certain kind of embodied normativity mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so anyone who is outside of that normativity is you know uh, could be runs the risk of being subhuman or non-human so why even engage with them okay. why not oppress them we, we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to try to synthesize a, a, a couple of questions into one that might allow each of you to offer some final remarks of about two minutes or so. Um, several questions in the audience want to make sure that we address how black churches are addressing uh, the generation gap, hip-hop, civil rights. Uh, the kind of prominent media image of black youth as super predators. Where are black churches in this discourse? And if I could open that up to the broader generational question, um, there's been a larger discussion about megachurches, televangelism, prosperity gospel as somehow 
at the same time of this generational shift as evidence of the decline of a true black church tradition that we've all dismissed, but still refer to it as such. So if we frame that along lines of this generational access, what is the significance of new media and technologies in terms of this conversation about black youth, but in terms of the contemporary landscape of black churches? What role do new medias and technologies, I know many of you write on the internet, show up on television, on the radio, what have you, how does, what do these new medias and technologies play the role, play, how do they play a role in adjust, addressing the generational divide, if we agree that there is one? I think there is one just because of the age of people in lots of congregations. I mean, you just can't get past the fact that there's, there's a gap, okay? So if we, if we acknowledge that, then, then the issue becomes, if you are used to being on Facebook and Twitter and you get your church gossip from somebody's blog and you can watch your favorite pastor on that, I, I don't know if it's not streaming the word network, it's streaming Daystar, stream. Dayspring, wherever streaming it is, it stream, yeah. that streams it live. Why do you even need to go somewhere? Right. This is, this is a big question. And so I think what churches will have to face now is that it makes it a lot harder to get somebody in the pew that has access to all these things and using them in certain kinds of ways. It's not that older people don't use them, they just use them in different ways. <clears throat> So I, I really do think this presents a, a, a very big issue. But the other issue and that, I, that I sort of alluded to that I think is a really interesting thing for me that I'm personally tracking is how many people are on blogging about their church or their denomination or that particular uh, gospel following they have. And that creates a whole other kind of space. And I don't know if anybody has really started to look at this in terms of African-American religion or African-American churches, but I think it is an important part of what's happening right now because things move a lot faster than they used to. So everybody's, the good and the bad is out there living on the internet in perpetuity. And so that makes it very interesting about what happens with churches and what kinds of churches have life and the ones that may not have life. You know, uh, I think one of the problems we have that with with some mega churches, and I say some because I've spoken and and and, and taught at Trinity, yeah, and uh, it's a huge congregation, and it's one of the most loving congregations I, I've experienced, and people know each other. But, and, I don't know how you know so many names, um, but uh, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. Um, and uh, mega churches can have a sense of community in that you follow like the class cell setting of the AME church supposed to follow, where there's everybody, the whole congregation is broken down into groups of 12 with a class leader. It's sort of a cell, and there's always someone to look after you, to be in touch with. And so a huge church can have a small church feel, and some of that was go is what goes on there. But one of the problems we have is that in too many churches, because they are so large, they are audience, a con we have audiences rather than congregations. And, uh, and so, and that is, and audience in the sense that they are performed to and uh, not really not really fed in, in the sense of, of the kind of nourishment that Eddie talked about, spiritual nourishment we talked about, er, Eddie talked about earlier. And with regard to young people, it's really problematic because Kirk Franklin made a statement oh, about 10 years ago in Vibe magazine. He said, I am the holy dope dealer and Jesus rock or crack is a drug I'm dealing and it'll give you a high like you've never had before. And um, what that, the problem with that is when, if you attract young people to the church with that kind of performance orientation where it's, and it becomes, you say, well, it's there about hip hop, so we'll make it hip hop. But if you attract them to that, that's what they're coming to. And, they're com and, and how, so how can we, you say, we get them there, we'll give them something different. But if people come there for that kind of performance, they're almost usually given, given nothing else. So the question is, we can get them in there, but then again, what are we giving them when we get, when we get them in there, and what does that mean in the final, uh, in, in the final run, and ultimately for our churches and for our society in terms of contribution we empower our young people to make through the churches? Um, I would say 
that in terms of the generational gap, first I want to say that um, there are uh, young people in the church. Mm -hmm. um, there are. Um, and yet we still see the generational gap. We still see this problem. And I would say um, two things. One, that there has to be a transformation of liturgy, mm -hmm. um, liturgical presentation. Now, does that mean that you go full hip hop to the hip hop style? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, but there has to be in a space for young people to feel as if they are welcome and that they belong. In terms of media, yes, young people are very media driven and engage in the various uh, social networks that um, are available to them. However, it's shocking how many young people I come across who will admit that they come to church for community. They actually come so they can touch and, and, and see, even amidst this e-driven society. Um, and so I think that speaks to this notion of having to have a place for them where they can come see and touch and feel like their being there is matters, that they are welcome in that space. And too many churches really don't welcome young people. Um, and so, and, and lastly, I would say that beyond the show, right, beyond the fast preaching, fast talking, dancing and all of that, singing, um, again, to this notion that people are coming to touch, to see, to feel, there has to be a re-evaluation of the ethic of care that goes forth yes. in yes. terms of pastoral yes. ministry, yes. right? Yes. So we have the priestly, True the serving God. communion, the baptism, the preaching, we have the prophetic, but what about the pastoral? Exactly. And people need that. People need to know that they are seen, that someone yes. cares. Yes. That someone is, is, is wondering, is, is wondering about them when they are not there. Mm -hmm. And too often, the reality is, you know, when they're not there, I'm glad they're not here this Sunday. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that there's always been a generation gap. It always has been generational uh, conflict. The challenge for us today is that I think that you have many churches, um, if I may use the, the analogy of Mary and Elizabeth, um, that uh, Mary, when she was pregnant uh, with Jesus, she went to be with a seasoned saint by the name of Elizabeth. And the challenge is that when you have a church that is only centered on Elizabeth, or a church that is only ministering to Mary, you have a problem. You have a church that may have a lot of wisdom but no energy, or a church that has a lot of energy but no wisdom. And what happens when we, we now come to a moment in our community where we no longer have Mary and Elizabeth churches? Because I think it's a good thing. The emerging churches that are developing with, uh, within our community, there are a lot of churches that are nurturing that Mary generation. And they do a tremendous job nurturing uh, the marriage generation. Elise Barrymore in, in Chicago, a tremendous pastor in Chicago Heights, a, a very distressed community, but uh, an emerging church. Uh, Phil Jackson, uh, the, the, the house, the hip at the house uh, church, uh, that's on the west side of Chicago, a uh, very distressed community, but pretty much you're not going to find anybody over 32 in those churches, which means there is a <coughs> gap in history and in theology. Um, that is problematic. There, there needs to be an Elizabeth. And there is a gap when you have a church that everybody is Elizabeth and they have no one. So, so, so that becomes, I think, the fundamental challenge. But as a post-soul or post-modern church, I think that the pillars of hip-hop should be instituted within the church. Um, that I think that you should use rap or orality, uh, technology, that's all that uh, you're talking about when you're you know, utilizing uh, uh, swiping, things of that nature, and dance um, and artistic uh, aspects, which we call graffiti, when you begin to utilize those, those things, it is a new transformative liturgy, mm -hmm. is what you're really talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and people are able to lead in those. 
Now, with the technology, one of the things that happens at Trinity, um, you know, the, Dr. Hendricks has been there uh, uh, to speak, and every Sunday we have 2,000 people who don't attend church but attend church virtually. We have 2,000 people every single Sunday uh, on top of everybody else. Uh, some of them give, some of them complain. Uh, they do everything that regular church members do. Um, and, uh, and they're part of the life, and we have created uh, a network. And that network that has been created has been created by the 20-something ministry uh, in our church. Uh, so there are, they tweet, uh, they blog, uh, they do the, the Facebook piece, uh, creating uh, conversations mm -hmm. around specific I issues, and they mobilize. Mm -hmm. And so we also utilize it as a mobilizing tool um, because we are, we're recognizing that there is such a deep hunger. I, I want to add this. Um, there is a break that's happening in the young evangelical community mm -hmm. where they are so tired of the personalized uh, doctrines that are being presented as saying this is what it means to be Christian and this is how you practice it in civic society. That they're raising questions around poverty, around race, and around HIV, and they are now partnering with black churches, and they are now finding Dr. King as a model and Howard Thurman as a model, which is fascinating, that within 20 or so years, the traditional evangelical community that we think of will not exist anymore. Um, it will be a, 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 a what they call red-letter Christians. And for those who may not be familiar with the term, is that we're red-letter Christians. You know, the stuff where Jesus says stuff in the red, that's what we believe. Um, and, and they're operating out of that context, that we're red-letter Christians. Uh, Shane Claiborne in, in Philadelphia is, is, is a gentleman who operates out of that red-letter uh, edition, um, where he connects with the African-American community and says that there is a hunger for us to be connected in a prophetic way because we have always been boxed in the personal and the private. And we want to move out of that. And within the African American community, there is a hunger for how do I apply my living, my faith in a, on a daily basis. I, I, got, I know how to shout. Show me how to serve. You know, I know how to praise. Tell me how to protest. I want to be able to, to operate with the cross. And if all you can do is one or the other, you have a stick and not a cross. And the, the, the challenge for this generation, I think, and for those who are nurturing is how do we build the kind of leadership development? Because we don't like young people taking hold of the mantle. We don't want them nurturing. We want in the uh, many me's, we want people that look just like us, speak like us, talk like us. They're not going to do it that way. Me. And every movement, every, or, every organic development of anything in our community has always shown that when you infuse younger people, mm -hmm. they will never operate the way you do. They will take the ethic of what is presented, but they will flip the script and go in a different way. And that becomes, I think, the, the fundamental challenge if the church is able to nurture another generation using the pillars of hip-hop and let Mary and Elizabeth work together so that we have power and wisdom in our churches. Thank you. Thank you, Otis. Eddie, you have a um, final word? It's hard to follow that. And he's been talking that way since we were at Morehouse together. So it's very hard to follow. And I agree with every word uh, that has been said. I think we need to understand African-American churches as, as dynamic institutional spaces. Um, we need to understand African-American churches as dynamic institutional spaces. Um, those narratives that fix our conception of the church um, oftentimes do more harm than good. Um, I'm, I'm just, as we were talking about hip hop, I was thinking about Tom Dorsey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about when the drums came into the church. Right? And I was thinking about the kind of resistances, right, when that blues chord made its way. 
right? Folks said, what was that, right? And, 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 and how the dynamism of worship, right, enabled this extraordinary creativity that's a part of a people who were trying to make sense of their living and do so in a joyous way, uh, to become a part of their worship, their celebration of God and their affirmation of his grace extended to them. Uh, if the church is dynamic, uh, the way it changed under the context, as I said, of the Great Migration, the way it shifted in the context of this black freedom struggle of the 60s and 70s, how will it look in this moment? Uh, in this moment when so many young people suffer from post-traumatic syndrome, when so many of them have seen somebody that they love get shot, and killed right in front of them. You know, so many folk are walking around proclaiming their piety. So many folk are walking around saying how saved they are. And somebody right in front of them just needs a hug and an affirmation that they are children of God, but you're walking around showing your feathers. And I would like to say by way of closing that my, um, the intensity of my remarks has something to do with my own personal struggle. My own sense of God's grace extended to me. My own acceptance of stepping into the expansiveness of his love. And my sense of the newly converted being kind of zealous. So I say this in this by way of conclusion that what I've heard tonight, it's relational, not doctrinal. That faith without love right, can lead to Pharisees. Has led to Pharisees. Yeah. And what I would hope to do as I grow up in my own faith uh, um, is to understand the power of the church and to take seriously Emerson's response to those young ministers at Harvard Divinity School, to insist that they not let their faith, their love of God, uh, be uh, atrophied uh, by the noise and chatter of those who claim to know who God is. Uh -huh.